Hello everyone, good to be back with you again for a lesson here in our discipleship study, uh, session 12, The Doctrine of the Church. God's people gather for community and scatter for a cause. Now let that be sinking in because those are two very important things right there, each and of their self, but they go together wonderfully. Um, last time together we talked about the power and influence of the Holy Spirit, and I hope you got as good a, a grasp about that as I did from studying that. And uh, me and Dwight were just talking um, how we really uh, stifle the power of the Holy Spirit and really belittle, really don't have understanding, and so therefore we really squelch the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives so many times because we're, we let ourselves get in the way and we're not letting Him do the things that He could do through us because He has all power. He has the power of Jesus Christ working through our lives if we just allow it to happen. It really does. And so... Um, like I said during that lesson too, if, if the Holy Spirit, if we're not experiencing the Holy Spirit working in our life, um, we need to change. It's us that needs to change. We need to, less of us, more of Him. Less of us, more of Him. Before we get started, I do want to go to the Lord in prayer. Um, I want to thank Him for all that He does for us. Uh, he does law. He's done so much already. And then there's so many things that we don't even realize the, uh, the work of the Holy Spirit around us all the time. I'm sure I don't. I sh sometimes I do uh, get the uh, joy of being able to look back sometimes and say, you know, that was nothing but the power of the Holy Spirit working right there. That's what that was in my life. It sure was. It wasn't luck. It wasn't happenstance or chance. No, it, it was the work of the Holy Spirit around me is what it was. sure was. I um, want to confess our sin. Really do. Always want to confess our sin to God. He, he knows about it anyway. He really does. He knows all about us. Confess it. And then most importantly, repent. Repent of those sins. So we can get those under the blood and move on and work for Him. Not get by, tied up and bogged down in it. Just confess it, repent, and move on and let the Holy Spirit work in us. Um, I want to pray once again for our hearts and minds to be open so we can receive... Um, the words that he has, and get the understanding that we need for what we're talking about tonight. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come thanking you so much for sending your Son to die for us. Lord, we come confessing our sins. Uh, Lord, repenting of those sins as we confess, Lord, knowing that we've grieved you, we've grieved the Holy Spirit. Lord, we know that, and we're so sorry. Lord, but we're so thankful for your forgiveness. Lord, help us as we study tonight, Lord, to open our hearts and minds to receive everything that you would have us to hear and hear and understand tonight. Everything. Uh, Lord, don't, don't let us close ourselves off to you, Lord. Help us to stay open to the leadership of your Spirit. We'll Lord, give you the honor and glory and praise. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Picture the following scenes. Got about five of them here. A small group meets in secret, quietly huddling in a subdued living room. Their presence is it legal in Saudi Arabia. If they're caught, some could be sent to prison. Others could lose their lives. The room falls silent as they hear footsteps outside their door. Thousands of affluent suburbanites gather in a large, state-of-the-art building in Atlanta. The lights, video, and production represent the best of the best. People come dressed in casual clothes, carrying their coffee into the worship center. The band cranks up and the room is flooded with moving lights and haze. The people begin to worship and their hands and voices are raised. Everyone wears white jumpsuits. Guards are posted around the room. As men file in, smiles break across their faces. A band begins to play upbeat music, which fills the hopeless space with joy. The men clap their hands in celebration. A man comes to the microphone and declares, Brothers, we were once free on the outside. Now we may be in prison, but we are free on the inside. An organ plays as rope choir members sway back and forth to the music. Even though there are few, they make a joyful noise. The people are sitting in old pews, meeting behind stained glass windows that picture the life of Jesus. Pastor gets up to proclaim hope to his congregation. Outside, the drug dealers and gangs make inner city Detroit a fearful place to live. 
Only one light bulb illuminates the cinder block building. <clears throat> People rode in the back of pickup trucks for several miles to get there, traversing the jungles of Guatemala. Most hadn't eaten all day, but after the service is over, they will share tortillas and soft drinks. Someone stands with a guitar and begins to lead out in a song. What all these half scenes have in common? The church. Not just a building, a group of people that have come together to worship the Savior. What comes to mind when you hear the word church? You know, I admit when my younger life is always a building. That's what I thought of with the steeple on it, high ceiling, those kinds of things. Um, you know, for some people, maybe music is the first thing they think about. You know, the old rugged cross or any of the newer songs, whatever. Maybe a preacher. Is that what you think about when you hear the word church? Or is it maybe the people, like we were talking about, all these different people that met? And I can relate to some of those. Uh, that last one there, I'll go ahead and put a little plug in for uh, our trips to Honduras. Uh, we've seen that exact type of condition. And it's going on down there and there. One of the guys just asked you to pray for him down there as he ministers in a place that uh, sounds just like that, except for the fact that he probably don't have the light bulb. It's probably minus the light. But people come for miles just to worship. Just to worship. The early church was a powerful movement that was both initiated and sustained by God. People were saved. Lives were transformed. The gospel was preached. And people were sent out to tell the nations about Jesus. Yet even in the early church, there were times when Christians needed a reminder to continue meeting and fulfilling their purpose. In this passage below, the author of, Hebrew, author of Hebrews reminded his fellow Christians about the wonderful access they have to God because of Jesus. He encouraged them to continue gathering together as a church to fulfill their missions. We're going to be reading in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, He has inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain, that is, through His flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since He who promised is faithful. And let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. You know, what's our initial reaction to these, that passage as we read that? Well, for me, as I look through it there, it's saying have confidence in His Word. He has told us. He has made us promises of what will happen if we'll but obey. And then it talks about supporting and encouraging each other. Because we all have struggles. I know in the early churches we read about it, and especially we're going to read about some uh, verses, some verses here shortly in here. Uh, it sounds like everything was just going great. You know, everything was perfect. And it may have been better than it is now, but they still had people there. So you know what? They still had problems. You know, uh, if we think about the disciples, who we want to sometimes put on pedestals, and I'm not trying to say they're not wonderful people, but they were just people, just like us. Uh, and the Holy Spirit was working through them, just like He wants to work through us. And they even doubted sometimes. You know that? They doubted if it was real, what was happening, and they were right there in the midst of it. So even the early church had problems, just like we have problems. On a practical level, what does it mean to watch out for one another to provoke love and good works? Well, what I said is, if you hang around other believers so that your influences will be good and not bad, right? Because we're just people. And if I hang around Dwight, for instance, I, that's a good influence for me. I'll go ahead and say that. I know that for a fact. Fly, Dwight is a good influence for me. But I could go out here in the streets and find a drug dealer. And if I hang around him, that's not going to be a good influence for me, is it? It surely is not. So that's what that's talking about 
when we watch out for one another to provoke love and good works, we're all trying to follow Christ and let the Holy Spirit lead us. So if we hang out together, we're going to promote those same things with each other. We're not going to provoke bad things. We're going to promote good things. So that's the what it's talking about, about uh, watching out for each other and provoking love and good works. As we continue exploring the doctrine of the church, we'll see how this passage not only guides us in understanding what the church is, but also how we should live and work as members of that institution. So what is the church? The church is a family. The church isn't an organization. Like my daddy says, it's an organism. A living organism is what the church is, not an organization. It's not a business or an entrepreneurial enterprise. When a person comes to faith in Jesus, he or she becomes part of God's family, which is the church. Just as someone is born in their physical family, Jesus said you must be born again to get to God's family. In God's family, God is our Father, Jesus is our big brother, and Christians become brothers and sisters as members of God's household. Earthly families grow when children leave home to start their own families. You don't stop being a member of your family when you leave home, but you do gain the opportunity to expand that family by starting something new. And that's the same thing with the church. How have you experienced the blessings of church family? How has the church family been a blessing for you? For me, it's always been encouragement. It really is. And I, I pick on Dwight because he's right here with me. But Dwight is an encouraging person. And it's because the Holy Spirit is working through his life. So why would I not become better by hanging around somebody like that? In fellowship with those people. And that's the blessing of the church family that I'm talking about. And also, I like to say sometimes that when I come into church... I can look around, and I can see somebody back there, and I'll say, you know, there's Dwight Ayers, and I happen to know that Dwight Ayers loves me, and that's good for me, to know that people love me and care for me. So that's another blessing of the church family. The scenarios you read in the, read in the introduction were all diverse pictures of local churches meeting in different places, cultures, and environments. Such meetings are vital for every follower of Christ. It's not enough to be a part of God's family on a grand scale, what we refer to as the universal church. We also need to be connected to a local collection of disciples. In other words, God wants you to find a home in a local church family. And Scripture confirms this truth. The majority of instruction in the Bible concerning the church has in mind a local congregation of believers. In fact, it would be a foreign concept to the biblical authors to think about being in the universal church without attending a local church. So what is the church? Well, here's one the author's one of many possible definitions. He says, The church is a family of baptized believers in Jesus Christ who gather for community and scatter for the cause of telling the world about Jesus. And that sounds about as good a definition as there is. So what are the consequences of avoiding membership in a local church? Well, some of the things I was talking about a while ago. Lack of fellowship with other believers. Uh, worldly influence. Less support in troubled times. Those kinds of things. I mean, who are you going to turn to if you don't have a fellow believer to lean on? You're going to turn to someone that's maybe going to give you revenge advice or maybe something like that? You know, so we need, we need that fellowship of the believers. Now that we have a basic definition of the church, let's look at what it means to gather for community and scatter for a cause. First, God's people are called to be part of community. The early church experienced community in a way that created inseparable and unbreakable bonds. God worked in powerful ways. The apostles taught, lives were changed, and the Spirit moved. People generously gave to meet one another's needs. They spent their time eating together in their homes and gathering in the temple courts for worship. It was an incredible period for the church. So we're going to read Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. Then those who gladly received His word were baptized, 
And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear became, came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all, as any one had need. So continuing daily, with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor, favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So what do you find most appealing about these verses? Well, I always say this when I hear this verse. The thing that appeals to me most is they continue daily in one accord. You've seen that lately in a local church? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> oh, man. Well, the reason that appeals most to me and the reason that is so important in this thing of Scripture because it brings about a huge realization the fact that they were all submitting themselves to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. That is the only way that they could be in one accord, is the fact that they were all being submitted to the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit was leading them all in the very same direction. So that way they had to be in one accord. And I've, I've heard many people say before, well, the Holy Spirit's leading me in this direction. And somebody said, well, the Holy Spirit's leading me in this direction. And they would be talking about the same project they're working on. Well, I'm here to tell you, the Holy Spirit ain't leading both of you in two totally opposite directions. It ain't happening. It cannot happen. The Holy Spirit does not want to confuse people. One of those two people, at least one of those two people was wrong. <laughs> both of them could have been, I don't know. But anyway, yeah, when somebody said the Holy Spirit's leading them in a direction, you better be pretty sure before you tell them the Holy Spirit's leading in a different direction. Because it, He's not leading in two different directions. That ain't happening. See, what obstacles prevent modern, modern churches from experiencing that level of community? Selfish desires and wants. That's the biggest thing. We all want what we want, and if I can't get it, I'm going to cry about it. Or I'm going to throw a fit, or I'm going to leave, or I'm not going to pay my tithe to that church. All kinds of excuses I've heard over the, over the years, that's for sure. The Spirit isn't directing the church in two different directions. It just ain't happening. If you see that the Holy Spirit is directing the leadership of the church, why don't you get in line and follow Him and go right along with Him? Because the Holy Spirit is wanting to lead us all in the very same direction. That's what He's wanting to do. I heard an old pastor say one time, um, Scripture may have many applications, but it's only got one actual meaning. Scripture has a meaning, then it can you be used to apply to all sorts of life. But it has but that one meaning. That's what Scripture is about. Holy Spirit is the same way. Because it is part of the Scripture. The church isn't only called together for community, but also to scatter for a cause. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we are called to make disciples of Jesus Christ, who make disciples, who make more disciples, and so on. That was one of Jesus' final commands. Here in Matthew 28, He said, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's one of my favorite scriptures right there. I am with you always to the end of the age. You know what that means? I ain't got to worry about it. if he's with me. He's with me. He has promised me. He is with me. How does the church make it easier for you to spread the gospel in your community? Well, just the simple fact, more manpower, more work done. Those kinds of things. If we'll come together and work together on spreading the gospel, it can go further, faster, those kinds of things. So that's another reason it's good to have a, a community of believers together, a greater reach, a greater outreach. What hinders the church from having a greater influence in modern culture? We fade back to that same old word, selfishness. Just us thinking about us. Not submitting to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's tough, I know, sometimes. We have our own desires. And I realize that. I ain't no, I ain't no more special than anybody. I have my own wants and desires too. I just need to put those away. And say, okay, Holy Spirit, you lead me. 
then I'll know that I am pleasing the Father. And I can have joy immeasurable just from that fact of knowing that I'm pleasing the Father because I'm submitting to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We've learned that the church has two primary functions, together for community and to scatter with the cause. It's easy to look at the church, describe the Bible, and desire to be a church like that. It seems perfect without any problems or challenges, but even the early church was imperfect. They dealt with conflict, baggage from the past, power plays, immorality, and bad leadership. But through it all, people loved Jesus and worked hard to correct the problems and be a true reflection of Jesus to the world. Today, there are no perfect churches. Churches are filled with and led by imperfect people. And just as there are no perfect families, there are some families that are healthy because they work through conflict, exercise grace and forgiveness, and work together for a common goal. The same is true of the church. When people in churches work through their conflict in the proper way, treat each other with grace and forgiveness, and work together for the sake of the gospel, they find health and peace. And that's what we really are looking for. Even if you don't realize it right now, that's what you're looking for in Christ is peace. Peace in knowing that you're worshiping the one true God and that He is satisfied with you. That's what we're looking for. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. God bless you. I love you.